At Kroger, shopping with pickup and delivery is the same as shopping in-store. Same low prices, deals, and rewards on the same high-quality items. It's one small click for groceries, one big win for busy families everywhere. Start your cart today at Kroger.com. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Save big on your favorites with the buy five or more, save a dollar each sale. Simply buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with your card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Welcome to A Million Other Choices. Once again, I am your host, Kim. The story I am bringing you today you've probably heard before, but it deserves a refresher. And if you do know it, you haven't heard me tell it. There has also been some interesting updates in the years since it first started making its rounds on the podcast scene. This is the murder of Lindsay Buziak. Yes, I know that many of you know this case, but did you know that in October of 2020, Capital Daily actually went to court to get the investigation files released? And they were partially successful until March of 2021 when the case was dismissed and then they couldn't get any more details. So I have access to some of the most up-to-date and factual parts of this story. And believe me, in all my research, this case has been conjectured on at length. And for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, let's dig in. Lindsay Buziak was born in Victoria on November 2nd, 1983 to her mom, Evelyn, and dad, Jeff. And then she also had a sister named Sarah. Lindsay grew up to be a very attractive brunette, like celebrity good looking. She was ambitious and fun loving, and people were very drawn to her. And by the age of 24, she had a wide circle of friends and acquaintances, fashionable and generous with an infectious laugh that few could resist. Her father, Jeff, described her to Dateline NBC as, quote, a spectacular young woman who could make friends with everybody, end quote. Victoria, and in particular the area of Saanich that we first visited in the Rena Virk case, is located within the greater Victoria area and has a population of about 117,000 people. And, as mentioned on several blogs and in internet posts about this very intriguing case, it's pretty small and everyone kind of knows everyone. So it's not hugely noteworthy that honest and decent people could have friends on Facebook or have traveled lightly in circles with less reputable sorts. Being on the coast, they have a bit of a drug issue in BC. It's a port for smuggling and lots of people are involved in that and lots of people run in the peripheral of that trade. I personally have no ties to drugs or anything criminal, but if I lived in Saanich, I wouldn't be surprised if someone I knew got arrested for drugs, is all that I'm saying. As the Black Arcadia writes on their blog, it's tough to have a social life without running into at least a few bad apples. And about two years before her murder, Lindsay, who by all accounts was clean as a whistle and not involved in any such illicit activities, did have friends on her Facebook page that were involved in some stuff. And in fact, her boyfriend at the time, Matt McDuff, and his twin brother, Malcolm, were friends with the Dal Kassar brothers, who were tied to the drug trade. And during the initial investigation, both Matt and Lindsay had their phones tapped. But it's very important to point out that neither Lindsay or Matt were ever considered relevant to their years-long investigation into the Dal Alcazar family. Anyways, moving on, Lindsay worked hard to get her real estate license and landed a job with Remax, which is one of Canada's top real estate agencies. Lindsay broke up with Matt, but they remained friendly. About a year after her breakup with Matt, Lindsay's boss, Shirley Zalio, liked Lindsay's go-getting and outgoing friendly nature and introduced her to her son, Jason. Jason was a mortgage broker with a real estate license and the ambitious and attractive pair became a real estate duo and were soon living together. Sometime in the day on January 31st, 2008, I tried tracking down the exact time of the call, but I wasn't able to, which is kind of strange since the police have all her phone records. 24-year-old Lindsay got a phone call from a number that she didn't recognize. All kinds of reporting say that Lindsay told Jason and some friends that the woman who called had a strong Spanish accent, which sounded almost fake. But according to Capital Daily, there's no record of it ever being called fake in the reports. Nowhere in any report or any recollection did Lindsay say who the woman had identified herself as, but it was probably a fake name anyways. 
only that she had gotten her number from a former client of hers. And according to some reports, she did get the name of the referral client, but wasn't able to get in touch with her because she was on holidays. But I don't really buy that because that means that she told someone the name and that has never been reported on. More likely, and according to the actual investigation files, she called around to a number of her former clients, but nobody knew anything about it. Anyways, the woman said that her and her husband needed to purchase a property in the next two days. It needed to be in the million-dollar range, and she jotted in her daytimer, quote, one million needs to buy in two days, new, three-bed, three-bath, large master bedroom, housekeeper, separate area for housekeeper, 15, 20 minutes, 530, and then a phone number. The caller said that her husband was being transferred to Victoria and they needed something quickly. Now, according to Lindsay's dad, Jeff, who is also a real estate broker, whoever this caller was had to have known at least a little bit about real estate transactions because she referred to this as an impending corporate transfer, which in regular speak is, I'm moving for work and I need something quick. She told her she would look into it and would call them back. And one more thing. The caller wanted the houses new or vacant, which kind of makes sense since she needed to move in fast, but it's rather convenient for some stuff that comes later. The call was also made to her personal cell phone and not her office or work phone. During that day, she told both Jason and her dad, Jeff, about the call, and both Lindsay and Jason were immediately suspicious about it. Who was this woman, and why did she pick her? She was a fairly inexperienced broker, so to Jason it just sounded too good to be true. According to a number of reports, she dubbed the couple the Mexicans. Now she did that, not me, I'm just stating the facts, not my business. She put the number in her phone as million dollar. Later that night around 8pm while chatting with her friend Rihanna, using her landline, her cell phone rings and she says, I gotta go, the Mexicans are calling on my other line, I'll call you back. The next day, Lindsay emailed the woman a few suggestions of listings and then spent the late morning with a girlfriend having lunch and getting mani pedis. She took a couple of calls from the woman. According to phone records, the phone was later learned to be a burner phone purchased back in November of 2007 and registered to Apollo Rodriguez, which is a fake name, but to a legitimate business address but with no connections to the case. A total of 10 calls came in and out of the phone, and the phone and whoever likely had purchased the phone traveled by ferry from Vancouver to Victoria on that same day that Lindsay was getting her nails done. That evening, Shirley, Jason's mom and Lindsay's boss, came to her house around 7.15 p.m. while Jason was playing hockey and overheard Lindsay arrange to meet the couple the next evening for a viewing at 1702 DeSosa Place in Gordon Head at 5.30 on February 2nd, which was the next day. She was still up when Jason got home around midnight from his game and was feeling apprehensive about the showing. Trust your instincts, people. She needed and wanted the money, but she was also feeling a bit sketched out about it, and she also had her friend's bachelorette party that same night, but that couple wanted to see houses and she would probably miss that, suggesting that this particular house wasn't the only showing that she had arranged for them. So Jason suggested that he would do the showing for her, and he reminded her that, you know, you got a call like much like that a couple months ago and you sold that house to try and reinsure her. But when he offered to do the showing for her, she said, no, that's okay, I'm going to do it. So Jason suggested he had some paperwork that would need her signature anyways, so he would come by and make sure that she was okay. She said sure, but she was adamant that she do the showing herself. And as Jason told police, Lindsay, quote, had a very strong personality and liked to do things herself, end quote. Now, something that I bet you didn't know about this case is that from the period of January 24th to February 3rd, 2008, her Facebook page went kind of blank. She had over 700 friends and would do daily updates, but during that two-week period, there were no messages and no comments, almost like they had been deleted. And on her other online accounts, messages had been deleted from there as well. Investigators have never figured out what was up with that. Facebook was pretty new at that time, so it wasn't on her phone, um, just her laptop. But as we all know, with Facebook, it can be hacked into. It's just very odd. Anyways, back to the day of February 2nd. Now, I don't know all that she did that day, but early in the afternoon, she came by the Remax office and chatted with the receptionist about the showing that she was feeling a little sketchy about. 
She asked her and another coworker to try and cross-check the phone number, but nothing came of that. It seems Lindsay is doing all the right things. She just doesn't listen to that little inside voice. So she met up at, with Jason at a restaurant called Sauce at 4 p.m., and Lindsay said that she had to eat fast because she wanted to stop at home and change before the showing. Jason again said, listen, just let me do the showing for you. But she said, nope, she was going to do the showing and still make it to the bachelorette party. And she must have actually eaten pretty quick because by 4.29 they paid the bill and she was back at the condo changing by 4.45. And Jason left Sauce to go to SHC Autographics, which is an auto shop, about five minutes from the restaurant, arriving there at 4.24. Lindsay had been hired to sell some property for this auto shop and Jason was going to drop off an offer. Hence the paperwork he would be bringing by at the showing for her. Now, to me, this all makes sense. It's kind of a ruse, kind of like if you're on a terrible date and your friend agrees to call you with an emergency. And while he was there dropping off the offer, Lindsay called him to say, I'm leaving now. Just after he hung up with Lindsay, Jason got a call from his friend Cohen Oatman, who he had made plans with to go for dinner that night. So Jason told him, look, I got to drop off something for Lindsay and check on her. So why don't you meet me here and we'll go together. I can drop it off and then we can go for dinner. So Cohen drives to the auto shop and leaves his car there and gets into Jason's Range Rover and off they go. Security cameras show them leaving at 5.30. Now a lot of conjecture has been made about Jason knowing that the showing was at 5.30 and not leaving SHC until then. Now I am a pretty punctual person, but often others are not. If I have to meet someone at 5.30, I allow for traffic, a flat tire, all the red lights to arrive at 5.25 but others, not so much. And for those that are chronically late, 5.30 means that's when you leave. He put the address into his GPS, but it wasn't working, so he called Lindsay back to ask for directions and to tell her that he'd be about 10 minutes or so. But she cut things short and said, oh, I've got to go, they're here. So he said, text me the address, and she did, and he responded with, we're on our way. But Jason's text to her was never opened. Two contractors working in the cul-de-sac 1702 was currently the only finished house in this cul-de-sac. So, um, so they were working on a number of houses, like building a number of houses in that area. They saw a couple, a man and a woman, entering the cul-de-sac on foot shortly after five. The man was about six foot tall with dark short hair and well-dressed with a brown full-length coat, and the woman had her blonde hair worn in a short bob and was wearing a Nine West dress. This is a short-sleeved and mostly black, and on the front in... Sort of this swirling pattern from bottom from the bottom up to the round neck is two bright fuchsia blocks of color with a block of white in the center, all in this kind of swirling pattern. I'm going to try and remember to put a link in the show notes of the photo, but I might forget, so just email me if you want to see it. She was described as Caucasian and about 35 to 40 years old. The contractors said that the, cu that the couple was greeted at the back of Lindsay's BMW by her and she had parked in the driveway and she had some papers laying on the trunk. Records show that the lock box on the house was accessed at 5.29 p.m. At 5.38, Jason texts her that he's just a couple of minutes away and this text was also never opened by Lindsay. At 5.41, Lindsay's Blackberry does make an outgoing call that's not answered. The police later believe that this was a pocket dial. When Jason showed up, he saw that the front door was open and he saw a male in the doorway, but only the back of him. And then the door closed just as they were pulling up. And then he saw the two figures through this frosted glass on the door, kind of like shadows moving. He saw her black BMW in the driveway, but there were no other cars or people around. So Jason and Cohan parked on the street and waited for about 10 minutes for Lindsay and the couple to come out. And now I think it was actually less time than that because Cohan and Jason then walked to the front door and it was locked. So this sparked a little concern for both of them because normally during showings you just leave the door unlocked. They tried the doorbell about 10 times according to both of their accounts. So then both of them walked to the back of the house and looked at the back entrance which was dark and then they went back around the front and looked into the windows and not getting any answer from Lindsay, Jason called his mom, Shirley, to try and get the direct number for the listing agent so that he could get the passcode for the garage since now the lockbox was gone. So at 6.05, he called 911. 
So if he texted her at 538 saying he was two minutes away and then sat in the car for another 10 minutes and then went back and forth, called his mom and the listing agent, that's a lot to do before his 911 call at 605. He also texted her, are you okay? Because she wasn't answering. On the call, he gave the usual explanation that she was doing this showing and it was, she was, had been uneasy about it. And now the door was locked and that he could see her shoes in the entranceway, but no one was answering. So they said that they would send someone out. And here's where it gets kind of super creepy. The two of them walked to the side of the house and over the fence, they saw that the back door was now wide open at which point they completely panicked. So Jason boosts Cohen over the fence and runs back around the f- to the front door. Cohen went through the inside of the house and unlocked the front door for Jason, and they do this panicked sweep of the house, barely registering that there were bloody footprints on the brown tiled floors. Cohen runs through the main level, and Jason boogies it up the stairs. Jason found Lindsay in the large master bedroom, which was located right at the top of the stairs. He yelled to Cohen who called 911 at 6.11 p.m. and told them to hurry. Jason touched Lindsay's arm for a pulse and tried CPR, but told police, quote, she was just lying on her back, you know, not moving. Nothing. So I went straight to her. I tried to give her CPR. I felt her skin. It was, she was already passed away, end quote. 24-year-old bubbly Lindsay Buziak had died of loss of blood due to multiple stab wounds. The exact number has never actually been released, but police have always described the killing as deeply personal in nature, suggesting it was a lot. When the Saanich police arrived, they checked the house to see if anyone was still inside and began searching the area with a canine unit. Jason and Cohen were taken to the police station for interviews. The search of the property for a weapon, hair, fiber, DNA, blood spatters have, has never been released as to what, if anything, they did find. What has been released is the police belief that the murder was well organized and carried out by people who had killed before. They surmise that the killers were leaving through the front door when Jason and Cohen pulled up and they fled out the back and probably into a vehicle that they'd parked nearby, possibly on Torquay Drive, which is directly behind Sosa. This would be consistent with the witnesses' statements of the, of the couple walking rather than driving up the cul-de-sac and the fact that all the vehicles on the cul-de-sac, once the police arrived, were accounted for. Now, let's get to some theories about who could have murdered Lindsay. First, we look at Jason, because it's always the boyfriend of the husband. Obviously, Jason didn't kill her, but there are theories that he hired someone to do it. He had the money, certainly, but why? Lindsay's dad, Jeff, said that Lindsay was thinking and talking about leaving the relationship and had confessed to him that she had made a mistake in Jason. But Jason says, no way. They were happy. Quote, I love Lindsay. I think about her every day. I want this case solved as fast as possible. I had nothing to do with it. End quote. Jason was cleared about a year into the investigation. There was just nothing to connect him to her murder. And he passed a polygraph, according to Sergeant Chris Holsley, who was a big part of the investigation. Chris Horsley said that it was a combination of evidence, including the text messages and surveillance videos that had eliminated him. Quote, we're quite confident he was not the person responsible for her death. They also looked into her ex-boyfriend, Matt. Um, They had been on again, off again between 2001 and 2006, but he said that he hadn't really talked to her in months before her murder. They also couldn't find any connection to him in the murder either. In August 2017, a public message was posted on a website that was run by Jeff Buziak, and the message, which contained a whole bunch of misspellings throughout it, said, I killed Lindsay and stupid cops will never prove it. Now, I couldn't find any updates on that specific lead, uh, so I have to assume that the person was found, talked to, given a lecture, and released without charges. In February 2021, Sandwich Police said that advancements in DNA analysis and other technology had created some new leads in the case. And, of course, the FBI has been working with investigators since early 2020. And then there's a couple of theories that have been making their rounds on the Internet. One particular theory has been floated around and gained a lot of traction from Lindsay's dad, Jeff, who has started a blog called lindsaybuziakmurder.com, which, don't look for it, it has actually been taken down. He has gone after, and I mean gone after hard, Shirley Zalio, Jason's mum. 
According to Jeff, in November 2007, right around the time that the burner phone was purchased, Lindsay had told some close friends that she wanted out and she was leaving Jason as soon as a few deals had closed. Lindsay had apparently seen something that she shouldn't have, but she never revealed to him what exactly it was. Jeff believes that at that time she may have realized that she was getting in too deep and wanted no part of whatever was going on. So basically that Shirley and Zal the Zalios were in to some kind of shady stuff and he's further suspicious because according to him within weeks of Lindsay's murder Jason was already out there on the dating scene he also accuses Jason and Shirley of associating with drug dealers now this theorizing got Jeff into some hot water in May of 2022 when Shirley launched a civil suit against him for slander Jason said quote we're not trying to stop Jeff from finding Lindsay's killers we're just trying to stop the lies and the people calling our family murderers when it's not true. In the notice of claim, Shirley details that between 2019 and, and 2021, Jeff published or arranged to have published more than a dozen defamatory comments about Shirley, or, Shirley and her alleged connection to his daughter's murder. Jeff's response was, quote, Shirley has been one of my biggest enemies. Doesn't Canada have freedom of expression? I express myself. The blog is a platform for people to express themselves. End quote. Now, Shirley has been cleared by the police as a suspect, and after an episode of Dateline came out in 2010 uh, about the case, flirting ideas of that theory, the Saanich Police Department came out with a public statement by Sergeant Dean Jansen, who said, quote, We feel that it's important to clear the air. Fingers had been pointed as a result of this program. End quote. In July 2022, after starting a GoFundMe page, Jeff has retained the investigation help of Zonta Research Group out of Vancouver to look into the murder and to help defend him against this defamation suit. So now this next theory I kind of like, but I don't think it's the exact answer. Remember Matt and Malcolm McDuff, her past lover? Well, they were good friends with the Dal Kazar brothers, who were major drug traffickers in Victoria, and Lindsay knew them too at least casually. Cirilio Lopez was their uncle, and when Lopez was arrested, this guy named Jazz Baines replaced him as the kingpin, a rival of Lopez's. On January 22nd, 2008, so a little under two weeks before Lindsay's murder, police in Calgary busted a house with $8 million of cocaine inside, one of Alberta's biggest drug busts in its entire history. As a direct result of this bust, 14 people in total faced charges, with two of them facing conspiracy to traffic charges, and one of the men facing the hefty conspiracy to traffic charges was Erickson Dalcazar. Lindsay had been in Calgary six weeks before that drug bust, and she is further known to have had some contact with Erickson, allegedly, but only by phone. Lindsay's known connection to the Dalcazars started rumors that Lindsay Buziak was the snitch. Now, of course, she wasn't. It was pretty much confirmed that she had nothing to do with drugs and was not on the witness list for any of the trials for this bust. But perhaps the Dal Kazars didn't know that and killed her out of revenge. The only reason that I like this theory is because Inspector McColl, who was from the investigation, said in 2011, it's not cool to tell on your friends. It's not cool to rat people out. Many times in a homicide investigation, you can get past that because it's also not cool to kill people. There should be some assurance to anyone that is considering speaking to the police that we're not really interested in the skeletons in your closet. We have the ability to put that aside and focus on what we're really interested in, and that's catching these killers. And then Detective Sergeant Horsley, who was a key investigator in the case, said, there is nothing in her life, and we've conducted an extensive background check that would indicate that she was involved in anything criminal, in anything of domestic violence relationship, and that is the most perplexing thing. It is also possible Buziak's killers were under the mistaken impression that she had revealed information she shouldn't have, or perhaps that she was somehow connected to a dangerous person without knowing it. You can be a person who just works and minds their own business in Victoria, Yet through a very brief network of friends, you could be absolutely connected to people that are involved in very bad things. And then further, Sergeant Dean Jansen said, this killing was very organized. There was a lot of planning and effort and forethought. These are the most complex crimes, and this is the most egregious crime, and often they can become long-term and complicated. There are people in the community 
who are withholding information, we know there is a bit of cone of silence around this. Now, crime scene investigator Yolanda McClary has stated that Lindsay's murder was not a contracted murder related to any drug cartel. She says it was brutal, but too amateurish. She believes that Lindsay's murder was very personal and planned by somebody very close to her, possibly somebody who had access to inside information from the Remax office. I personally would hope with the private investigation firm that's been hired and the FBI helping that we're soon going to have an update on this case. In the meantime, that was the murder of Lindsay Buziak. If you have any information, however small or insignificant that you think it is about Lindsay Buziak's murder, I hope that you have already come forward. But if you haven't, please contact the Saanich Police Department's Homicide Unit. There is also a tip line through Zonta Research, but because of the fact that they've been hired by Jeff Buziak, and Jeff Buziak seems to have a little bit of tunnel vision towards uh, Jeff and Shirley, I don't really know that I would put your tips in there. I tend to follow my instincts, and my instincts say to call the police and not subcontractors with this kinds of thing. I will be back again next week with a solved case. And as always, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>